Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. My mission here is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, did during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple and expanding crises during their day-to-day working hours. Can we turn things around? We'll find out. To tell this story, I need loiners, loiners like you, dear listener. I need people in Leeds or people from Leeds to come on this show and just tell me what they do and let me record how this decade affects us. Please do donate any amount you can to the Working Hours Project through PayPal or consider sustaining Working Hours with a regular £1 a month or more subscription on Patreon.com. Addresses for support are in the outro. This is intended as an expansive and expensive long-term project which I want to make available to anyone and I can only do that with your help. So if you can, please help. What did you want to be when you grew up? So firstly, um, when I was a child, I wanted to become a midwife. And to be honest, I'm not sure why. Um, I think partly because I used to watch Casualty as a kid, like medical things just like intrigued me. But Mm. I don't know why I specifically wanted to be a midwife. And I remember like at some point, like I don't know when it was, I then decided I wanted to be a historian. So like history's always fascinated me. I didn't know what it was particularly that I wanted to specialise in. And like that's changed anyway throughout the years um, as I've Mm. studied different types of history. But uh, I always remember as a child at first, I was really interested in the Victorians and like World War II and things like that. I always loved studying history at school um, and I always felt as well like I belonged in a different era. I don't know why, but yeah, I think I always wanted to be in the 1960s. Like it just seems fun. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, I was, I think I was a fan as well of the fashion and things Mm -hmm. like that as well. I've always grown up as well around history. So my mum collected a lot of stuff when I was a kid. So she collected um, door furniture, antique recipe books and things like that and that got me really interested in history and we always used to visit museums and galleries um and so especially Leeds University special collections um mm. they have two galleries downstairs in the Parkinson building and I always remember like the first time that I went there I was like wouldn't it be amazing if I could work here you're listening to series four episode two and to my guest Sophia Lambert this is another zoom interview recorded on the 8th of February 2023 hey up Sophia Lambert is a team assistant at the University of Leeds Special Collections and Galleries, invigilating the research centre and galleries as well as helping with preparing and running events. Sophia is also an Anglo-Jewish social historian and a recent history graduate of Leeds Beckett University and the University of Leeds. Remember, listener, there's five main ways you can support any podcast and the more of these you can do, the better for the shows you like. Follow, listen, share, guest, donate. Loiners, get your ass on this show and then get your friends and neighbours on it too. Right, let's do this. Episode 82 of Working Hours with Sophia Lambert. What is it that you are doing now? So I only started working on Tuesday at the University of Leeds. Um, So I'm a team assistant working in the university special collections and galleries. So special collections are rare books and manuscripts um, and other items that are of unique value and importance. They're often quite rare, fragile, um, and we hold like lots of different collections, furniture, things to do with World War I, World War II. Mm. So I help out in the galleries. I invigilate, make sure, you know, that people aren't touching the paintings and things like that, answering visitors' questions. Mm. I also help with the preparation of running events. Um, so I also help with um, basic collections management as well. So looking after like the climate control systems, making sure everything is a, is a consistent temperature and things like that, general housekeeping checks. I also help out upstairs in the research centre as well, just retrieving objects, um, 
helping to set up for different class workshops because a lot of students come in with their tutors for different lessons. So is an essential kind of an essential work tool for you would be, I guess, a pair of pristine gloves for, for touching rare items. She, that's, yeah, and that's interesting you should say that because we don't tend to wear gloves because mm. of manual dexterity. So if, say if you were handling a rare book, it actually be better for you to wash your hands first before handling it mm. and then touching the pages, mm. um, you know, to minimise the amount of grease or anything, you know, say if you'd had a snack or something before touching the book. Mm. Because if you didn't, so if you don't have gloves on and, you, you know, you touch a rare book, then it's easier for you to tell, you know, oh, this feels fragile or like I'm turning two pages at once, that sort of thing. Mm. But if you have gloves on, you lose that manual dexterity. Mm. Mm. Because, I mean, that's always what you see on TV, isn't it? Of, like, yeah. when they do a history show, it's like, oh, here's the rare thing, and I must put these gloves on. And Yeah. Yeah, but that's really interesting. Um, so uh, let's let's stay on the roll a bit longer. So obviously you're kind of, you're in your element here, aren't you? Yeah. Quite, quite literally. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I mean, how's it, how's it going so far? Obviously you're really new to the role, but yeah, yeah. Is it, are you enjoying what you've seen so far? Yeah, I'm really enjoying it. It's nice um, to see, you know, some of the items in the collections that I haven't had the chance to look at before. Mm. Often, you know, I'll get sneak previews of exhibitions and things before, mm. you know, before they open to the public. You know, I get to handle all these objects, you know, that the public can't touch or, you know, aren't usually on display and things like mm. that. So, you know, I feel quite privileged. Mm. Mm. That's cool. So... Yeah, let's go into how you got into it then. So, I mean, I'm assuming it's, I mean, obviously you tell me, but like, is it degree course in history? And then you sort of, you, you've applied to this after a number of other jobs or like how, how did you get into it? So I've been volunteering in museums and involved in public history projects since I was 15. So I'm from Doncaster. So the first public history project that I got involved with, um, was the Doncaster 19 to 19, uh, 1914 to 1918 project. It was like mm. a First World War centenary project and I was a researcher and cataloguer. And like from there on, like it sparked my interest in public history. So working with the public on history projects, getting people to research about a specific theme and getting them to choose the themes for, say, an exhibition or... Um, helping out with um, coming up coming up with ideas for things that need to be researched, um, and from so from then onwards in 2018 I moved to Leeds and I studied a degree in history at Leeds Beckett University, mm. and that was such a great experience. I really enjoyed working on public history projects. They were always really keen to get us involved with local organisations. So just a shout out to the two lecturers that were involved in those projects. So. We worked on a Leeds um, Blitz project, which, which was really, really good. Um, mm. So we worked, that was involved, uh, that involved working with West Yorkshire archives and Leeds um, museums and galleries. And we, create, we created a website about the Leeds Blitz and things mm. like that. And that really sparked my interest in public history. So I decided to then go and work with Leeds City Museum and their 200th birthday project in 2020. So I helped them with the housing section of the exhibition, just doing a bit of research um, and writing the interpretation, so the labels for the objects and things like that. And then it was from there that I decided to do an internship with Leeds City Museum as well um, and Abbey House Museum, working with um, the curator for Leeds History, digitising photographs mm. and things like that, which was, it was really interesting. And that set me up then for getting this role as a team assistant um, mm. at Leeds University. Mm. So was the, the sort of digitising the images, is that to do with the Leodis photograph project as well, or is that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I was basically digitising the photographs in Leeds Museums and Galleries collections, mm. um, researching them. So I have a lot of knowledge of Leeds history, um, mm. and I could ident I could easily identify some of the images and tell you know tell them um, where they were and a bit more about them. Mm. 
Mm. So I researched and digitized them and then wrote the descriptions for them, which were then uploaded onto the Leodis website. Mm. So I've got to ask this. So I, I worked at, uh, when I was down in London, I worked at this uh, conservatoire and mm. one of the guys that I was working with, uh, he was the registrar there, he, he was a historian. And we were like clearing out old folders from a thing mm. Right. And, you know, like as we're going through stuff to see if it's like, do we keep this, do we throw this away? What is, what is it? You know, he's the historian in him obviously is like, Ooh, you know, really interesting. <laughs> so was yeah. that project just like, you're just going through your stuff and go, wow, this is amazing. And like, was it quite slow going? It was honestly, it's absolutely fascinating. So Kitty Ross, who's a curator of Leeds History at Abbey House Museum gave me over 500 photographs to digitize mm. in within a certain amount of hours. I was like, I'm never going to get through all of these. I actually ended up carrying on the role voluntarily afterwards. Mm. Um, so I just got so interested in it. It was so hard because I ended up going down a rabbit hole with so yeah. many of the images. Yeah. I kept finding ones and this, I was like, this is fascinating. Like we found a set of glass plate negatives that showed the Leeds gas strike from 1890. And the images were really interesting because they were sort of taken as if that person was in the crowd. They were taken from such a unique angle and they were like, mm. like really informal. Unlike a lot of Victorian photos, you know, where it's clear that people are posing for that image. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I got to research them. There were some absolutely fascinating images in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I can imagine that all the time of just sort of, oh, well, that's there and trying to place things. and Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go into let's go into some of the questions. Obviously, you're going to be in different workplaces and so on for things like the lockdown question. And obviously, you're quite early into your new role. So, you know, feel free to draw on other roles and so on if, if it feels more applicable to you. So let's start with COVID first. So... I generally want to look at how people remember going into lockdown and yeah. was that impression of sort of, obviously we didn't know what was happening, how long things would last and all of that kind of stuff. But if you were working at the time, did that mean sort of initially a big increase in workload or a huge reduction in workload? And then I just want to try and look at what do you think changed for you in the longer term? So at the time of the first lockdown, I was in the final year of my undergraduate degree. So everything moved online. And at that time, I didn't have a job from about February to March because I was working on my degree. I didn't, like I had my student loan, like I didn't really need one. Mm. But then I think it was April that year. And um, what happened was um, something came up a job opportunity at, at Leeds Beckett University as a careers ambassador. Mm. So working with the careers team, like to try and make the careers department more accessible to underrepresented students. So those from different backgrounds, um, BAME, LGBTQ+, students with disabilities. Mm. So I decided to apply for that and it was only about three, four hours a week, but I thought, oh, like it's a, like it's a little bit of extra money and, you know, mm. something else for me to do. So it was a bit weird because it was like my proper, my first proper job interview and it was online. So yeah. I was being interviewed by these two people that I'd never met before um, on my Microsoft Teams. I was like, right, okay. Um, so I got the job, um, started working. I was like, well, this is strange. I'm never going to actually meet these people that I'm working with, the other yeah. ambassadors. Like, you know, we were all working remotely. We all had, like, the remote working software. software. Mm. Um, we met each week online. Everything just completely online. We never went into the office. So, yeah, that was a bit weird. Um it didn't really have much effect though, like on my workload or anything with the paid work that I was doing or my university, but like that, it all yeah. remained the same throughout the lockdowns. Um, but I'd say the effect like long term, I think is kind of opened up more opportunities for me. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of jobs that I kept seeing advertised, you know, that were remote working, yeah. Leeds Beckett, I know, like, seemed to offer, like, more roles, um, you know, with the option to work from home. Yeah. 
and things like that. Yeah. With the lockdown happening while you were still studying, do yeah. you think that gave you any preparation for the sort of remote working? I mean, had do you had any sort of previous experience of working remotely or or I mean, or even with yeah. the lectures? I mean, because they've for a while, like the lectures mm-hmm. have been recorded and so on, haven't they? And a lot of people yeah. will sort of access things remotely. So were you a person that did that or were you because I'm quite a classroom based person. I'm not very I don't like to do sort of too many online classes. I'd rather be in person. So how how is that adjustment? I really liked it because um, so the module that I was studying, one of the modules I was studying at the time was called Street Lives. And it was like about urban history and like how we use space, how that shapes our mm. identity, but also how like sort of like the converse of that as well. What I really liked about that was um, it transitioned really well to like an online module because the lecturer, he went out, um, he went to Chapel Town, he went to all these different places around Leeds and like did a mini video, like each week start off the lecture. It's yeah. like each um, lecture was based on a different part of Leeds. So like for one week, we looked at um, the Yorkshire Ripper and Chapel Town and like prostitution and things like that. So he went up to Chapel Town and filmed you know, all right, round Spencer Place and mm. everything. So that was nice. Like we wouldn't have got that, you know, had we have just gone to an in-person lecture and sat in a lecture theatre. You know, it really shaped things up with how the lectures were delivered. You know, so I also studied a digital history module as well, which was really good. Like we made our own websites and things like that. Um, and like the way that that was delivered changed as well. Um, Let's do the sort of. Uh like a little bit on work-life balance and and okay. kind of mental health through through the lockdown how did you find that I'm imagining were you in a house share sort of initially when you were locked down yeah so I was living in a flat um, not too far from Leeds Kergate market yeah so I was living with four other people um, and in the end it just ended up being me and another person because everyone else had gone home hmm. So it was hard because like we didn't really talk, me and this other person, um, mm. all that much. Um, like it's not like we didn't get on. It's just like I don't know. Yeah. We just weren't really like it's, you know that compatible in terms of like we weren't like friends or anything, best of yeah. friends. Um, oh. But like it, yeah, it was quite isolating. So I was like relying on like these couple of hours of contact, you know, a day through seminars or whether it be through meeting the other careers ambassadors online mm. you know sometimes I could phone home um, and like have a conversation or whatever but yeah I mean it was quite isolating like I'd go out you know the one hour a day exercise and then the rest of the time like you could hear upstairs downstairs people having either like you know like parties or whatever <laughs> like within the flat or playing music or whatever and you know just being able to see like just outside this window looking out over the city and it's like yeah it's really nice and everything but like I can't go out like it's just you know it's like within touch but I can't like I can't reach it yeah it's, it's, it's kind of like weird. a punishment for yeah the, here's what you could have won it's yeah the city just here. <laughs> yeah um, yeah so let's go on to Brexit yay um so, I mean, it's been what, uh, two years now, um, yeah. since we Brexited. Has it affected your work at all that you can notice? Uh, has, and if it has affected your work, has it made things better or worse or made no difference? I don't think it's made any difference, my way. Like, I was thinking long and hard about this last night. I was like, no, like, I can't think of any area that it's really affected. Mm -hmm. a lot of people answer that that way um yeah okay i'm gonna accept that as an answer (laughs) because you can we can go down rabbit holes with brexit let's do social media because i would imagine obviously with the photographic project a lot of that went Mm -hmm. on to social media i don't know if or how much you were involved in any of that i would imagine that there's stuff that you have to do in your new role in terms of some posts or maybe there's a social media person that takes care of all of that for you but the questions around how much time do you need to put into it and do you see that time as valuable like do you see a good return on investment at that time um so i don't really 
use social media all that much in my role and there is um a marketing social media marketing um mm. person who's in charge of all that and i know that i get the opportunity to um contribute to this thing we have on twitter called two minute treasures so um i can't remember how often it is but i know that a staff member will pick an object of interest to them in the collections and um, so they record themselves for two minutes talking about that object basically trying to persuade people you know that this is of interest you know mm. giving a bit of history behind the objects telling people why is it so cool and um, so that gets that gets posted on twitter we do use social media a lot in the gallery mm. um, we use it to highlight the work that we do and um, mm. share interesting collection items and also like keep people informed and up to date about the events and exhibitions that we hold. I'd say that, you know, we do get quite a lot of interest. You know, you can see from the comment, like from the comment sections, when I've looked through posts that people, you know, are interacting with it, say asking questions about the objects, yes. you know, people DMing us about, um, you know, upcoming exhibitions and things like that. Mm. And, you know, when people, I've had people before as well and overheard people when they come into the galleries. Oh, like I saw this on social media. So, mm. you know, it definitely does work. We are do we are making the steps in the right direction. Mm. And it's, I mean, it's good for, for promotion, but it's also good for, you know, from a, a funders and funding kind of perspective, it's, it's good to yeah. kind of show off the value of it and, you know, that people appreciate it and, and so on and so forth. I know as well that you're involved in Hidden Histories. Leeds, Leeds right, Hidden Heritage. Leeds Hidden Heritage. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I set that up in January 2021. It's just an Instagram page. I was just inspired by all the work that I was doing at Leeds Beckett in my digital mm. history module. Like I learned some really cool techniques like using History Pin, which is like a website where you get a photograph and you kind of like overlay it on um, Google Earth and like try and make it match up with the street. So, you know, you get that perspective, like this is what it used to look like, you know, this is what it looks like now. Mm. So I tried to implement some of that into um, my account as well. I also, I just really love Leeds as a city. Like I love Leeds history and like I had all this knowledge and people, you know, constantly tell me like, oh, like, you know, you're just like a wealth of knowledge. Like when it comes to Leeds history, you know, mm. you need to find a way, you know, to share this with other people, like beyond your friendship group. I was like, right, well, I'm going to set up an Instagram page. I don't care how many followers it gets. You know, if it's a few people, I just want people to be interested in this city's history. I want people mm. to know more about what is around them because it also amazed me just how many people like students People, lawyers who have lived here like all their lives, like things around the corner from them, you know, like they'll notice things. They'll be like, oh, what's that? They don't go and research it, you know, they just accept that it's there. Mm. You know, that curiosity might be there as well, but they don't actually act on it. I'm like, right, I'm going to do the work for you. <laughs> mm. So I'll go and I'll find things in the city centre or just when I'm walking about, like looking for inspiration, mm. like, I'll focus on a location or a person often use images from the Leodis website, some of which I found out I'd actually digitized myself, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll just do a bit of research about them and then I'll write a short post and take some photos of what the site looks like today mm. and just try and get people, you know, to be interested in what's around them and like comment in the sec, you know, in the comment section, oh, well, like I remember this or, you know, thanks for posting about this. You know, I'd really like to know more about X, Y, and Z. But yeah, it's going really well so far. I've got over 1,300 followers. So, yeah, you know, I'm going to keep going with it. <laughs> do you think you'll get more ambitious with it? Do you think it's going to turn into sort of videos or podcasts mm. or anything like that? Or do you want to keep mm. it? Because obviously that's more work yeah. for you. But I mean, how do you feel about it at the moment? Are you just kind of like, we'll stick to pictures for now? See, I have thought about doing different things with it. Like I'd love to create like a walking trail or like an ArcGIS story map, which is just basically like it's a map and you put icons on it and mm. like text boxes that you can expand and, you know, you write a bit of text, you can upload an image and things like that. And like just bringing in some more of these skills that I've learned from, like I say, the digital history module. 
Mm. Somebody also approached me and asked me if I'd like to do a podcast um, and like bring some of the posts to life, which I think would be quite nice because as well, obviously, there's a word limit in each post and I don't want yeah. to write too much in case people say, oh, I'm not actually interested in this because mm. they take about two hours, if not more, to produce each one. Yeah. So it'd be nice to do like a mini podcast episode on each um, location or person. Mm. Yeah, but then you'd still have to, you know, you're still having to produce posts to promote your your other content. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot of possibility, and obviously, the more the more knowledge you accrue, the more you want to kind of get it out of your head as much as putting yeah. it to your head. But let's go to climate change. In your work, is there anything that you can do to kind of promote awareness or mitigation or adaptation like what what can you do work-wise in relation to climate change um so well climate change like tackling is a really important thing that the university has been so we have like a whole climate plan um mm -hmm. that we started back in 2019 and it basically established seven principles to address the crisis so that included setting like an ambitious target of reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions um, by 2030. Um, so we're trying to adapt some of the buildings um, around campus. It can be quite hard. So the building that I work in, the Parkinson building, is quite old. So obviously we have to respect the architectural features and things like that. So being aware um, if we're replacing old radiators, you know, with new electric ones, um, we're also trying to reduce um reduce emissions sorry and like become carbon neutral by making sure that we recycle as much as possible so we have this thing at leeds called great food at leeds um so they do the catering for mm. events and things like that so um say if we have an event on down in special collections we'll order so we'll order some catering but what happens is um we're given like compostable cups and things like that food waste by Everything has to be biodegradable. We're given different coloured bags um, so that, you know, we can put the relevant things in the right bags and then they get, you know, taken off and recycled properly, things like that. Mm -hmm. I think climate change, like, in working at Leeds University, it's like made me a lot more conscious about how I act when I'm at work. So making sure when I leave the stacks, for example, if I've just retrieved an object, turning off the lights and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just trying to be sustainable as well in the way that I get to work. So walking to work as much as possible. With the Parkinson building, does that, I, I suppose the, what I'm trying to ask here is, is like, is that building being an old building, yeah. does that limit kind of things you can do? Not just with the building, but I mean, in terms of behaviours, thinking about, yeah. you know, like built environment, like does that being an older building does that encourage better or worse behavior do you think i mean it, this is purely subjective obviously but um yeah do you think it kind of is conducive to because in some ways i'm thinking that something built before you know kind of the oil how old's the parkinson i'd say i think 1920s 1930s mm. yeah so i mean it's You've got early days of cars and so on. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, in the way that we're building things, I mean, is it is it a big drafty building where you have to put the heat in on all the time or is it quite well insulated? Like, um, So there's the Brotherton Library within the Parkinson building. Um, I'm sure, I don't, have you heard of the Brotherton Library? Yeah, yeah, I've been in it, yeah. Oh, you've been in it there, great. Um, well, the central room um it's, it's absolutely massive, like really high ceilings. It's always freezing, cold in there, despite the fact, you know, they have the heating on. There's quite a lot of spaces within that building that are really hard to heat, you know, because of the mm. high ceilings, lack of insulation, things like that. But I know, you know, you go in some rooms and you can obviously notice like a lot of di temperature different. Yeah. But yeah, I think it is quite a big challenge, you know, and mm. I think it's going to, cause them to cause the university to struggle you know to reach this net zero greenhouse gas target by 2030 mm -hmm. it's like i say you know i don't think these parts there's a lot of 
in parts of the building that are just not well insulated or like the architectural design doesn't allow for them to become, you know, a lot more um, energy efficient. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, how were the sort of record breaking heat days? We like last year, oh, you went there for it though. So I suppose it'd be hard to tell, but um, yeah, I was, I was going to ask, yeah. did the, did it work the other way as well of, you know, did it make it cooler on the hot days? Cause you had that kind of empty void to, to obviously take longer to heat, but I mean, yeah. obviously if you've got anything that, you know, if you, if you were working in there and you've got that knowledge, but obviously you've just started in the role. So yeah. How was, how was that? Um, so I actually studied my master's in social and cultural history at the University of Leeds. So I used to study in the Brullerton Library like last summer. I can remember, yeah, it was one of the coolest parts of the university, especially all across Parkinson Court, you know, because the high ceilings and everything, yeah. like it was, you know, it was quite cool. They've got aircon on in there as well, uh, ventilation system, so it was fine. Mm. So we'll do the change question. Okay. So if there are any three things that you could change about your, again, broaden it to work in general, because obviously you're kind of new to this role, but if there's anything yeah. specific with the role that you've kind of noticed already. Um, but yeah, if you could change any three things about your work right now, what, what would they be? I wish there was more time for us to get together as a whole department. I mean, I don't know, maybe they organise more socials and things like that than I'm aware of, but it would be really nice to get together with like the galleries team and the team that work in the research centre in special collections and just get to know everyone and have more socials and things like that. Or even if we just had like a staff meeting in person as well, because I noticed from um, logging onto Microsoft Teams that there's a lot of Teams meetings, so online, which, mm. you know, it can be quite hard, you know, to get to know people. You're not going to have, you know, that conversation stood over by the coffee with somebody or like, you know, as you leave in the room, you're not going to bump into somebody and get introduced to them. Like it's, as a new member of staff, like it's been hard for me, you know, like getting to know people. So obviously the strikes are going on as well. So mm. not all members of staff are in the university um, mm. at the moment. I'd say the second thing is like having the opportunity to just stand outside on the parking steps and shout about how great the galleries are. Like I'd love to be able <laughs> to go out and wander around Parkinson Court and say to students, you know, like, look, there are two amazing galleries here that you can go and visit. You don't have to be a history student. You don't even have to be alumni. Like, you can be anybody. You can be Joe Bloggs off the street and you can just come in and mm. explore and see the collections and see what we've got. Mm. Because the amount of students and the amount of people that don't know about the galleries, you know, they'll go from studying from year one to year three of their undergraduate degree they mm. graduate, they'll go in the Parkinson building and they'll just happen to stumble across the galleries and they're like, oh, I didn't know these were here. And it's like, mm. they're advertised all over the university, but, mm. you know, like, it'd just be nice to see more people in that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like we don't see what we're not looking for and sometimes we don't right. see what we are looking for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what was I going to ask you on, on that? So was there a third one? You've done two. No, like I've been thinking about this since yesterday. I mean, I even started working that yesterday yeah. as well. So. <laughs> but yeah, no, I can't think of anything else that I'd add to that. Well, going back to your first one, I, I, I mean, to sort of elaborate on that or add to it, it it's, I, I'd say in terms of, because an important part of any workplace is, is like you're absorbing the culture as well, yeah. like the way that things are done and so on. And yeah. if you're, sat remotely you, you just can't do that because no. you need to be immersed to absorb yeah. a culture don't you and you can't be immersed when you're remote so yeah um are you so i'm assuming you're hybrid in the role um so i am mainly based um on the site in the parkinson yeah. building but i do know you know at some point say if we do have like a staff meeting or anything like that um or if there's training and things like that then it'll either be it'll be most likely to be online um mm. not in person so mm. Mm. yeah 
yeah and how are you for sort of space in you know when you're working remotely are you are you quite good with the separation do you have a good sort of somewhere else to work like an office space or somewhere or is it sort of sat on the end of your bed kind of working from home so I do have a desk in my room but I try to keep that separation by going and working in the living room yeah. so we've got a table in there so I'll go and work there because my two other flatmates um have jobs where it's you know more like you go to work you know you mm. do the job there and then you come home and you're finished mm. so you know I've got that space to just mm. take over the living room and just use it as my office which is nice yeah you kind of need it don't you it's, yeah um yeah although not everyone some people are quite fine with you know yeah in life are all one big blur um <laughs> but yeah so we'll do the ubi question so if there was a universal basic income how do you think that would affect your attitude to work would you for example do the job that you're doing now if you would, would you still do it the same way? Maybe you would reduce your hours or, you know, have other other things you'd like to bargain with. Would you not work at all? Like, how would a UBI change things for you? I'd still want to work because at the end of the day, I love, well, I know I've only been there for two days, but, you know, I love my job. Like, I have this feeling, you know, it's going to be great. You know, it's an excellent development opportunity. Like, I love mm. learning. I've got a thirst for knowledge. So I wouldn't want to give my job up. Um, having the UBI would be great because it would just be a security blanket. You know, it'd help with the cost of living crisis. So it'd be a huge weight off my mind. But then at the end of the day, like I, like I say, I do love my job and I'd want to be doing something, you know, that gives me fulfillment. Mm. Like I love helping people. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't want to give up my job. Mm. I mean, if you were working like, for example, I mean, could you see yourself sort of working in a bank and just doing history on the side like, or would it, you know, have you, what am I trying to ask here? But I suppose in, in terms of your history, cause I'm thinking, you know, you've kind of got that like musician slash filmmaker thing of like. You want to do it even like however you can do it. So I get the sense that, you, you know, you want to do history. You're going to do history. You're going to be like finding things out. But do you think that could be something, uh, say, for example, you're in a situation, you're kind of like, I need to earn more money. Would you be looking to earn more money within history? Or would you like, I'm going to take this job for the money and I can get my history fix elsewhere? Yeah, I think, yeah, probably the latter, to be honest, because as long as, you know, like I'm earning enough and I can find some way to feed my interests. Mm. I mean, like I was working in a cafe before Christmas. I mean, it wasn't what I wanted, but like it was, it was, you know, I was just doing it for the yeah, money, like to pay the bills. Yeah. I got my history fix from elsewhere, you know, running the account, like I write articles and things like that. I love doing research. So, you know, mm. it was fine. Mm -hmm. yeah because yeah. i'm so, so i'm thinking within a ubi obviously with a ubi everybody would have more free time ideally yeah um which i'm sure they would fill quite quickly <laughs> <laughs> yes but you know in that kind of situation hopefully there would be more freedom and more time for other people to kind of put you know explore their own interest in mm. history and just other people to kind of fall into history because it's one of those things it's like learning in general i think it's sort of a, because a lot of people have really bad experiences with history and history yeah. lessons and so on in school and you get very limited kind of kings and queens and it doesn't always yeah. seem applicable to you whereas i feel if it's something that's you know local physical mm. like yeah. that you can relate directly to it's really impactful and it's really kind of oh this is you know this is relevant to me in my life so I think there would be a greater expanse of of people who would were interested in it um yeah I'll let you respond to any of that if you want to no I completely agree with you because I think in some ways it's like just time as well you know like you just you know, when you're working and everything, like there's only so many hours in a day, mm. you know, people are just like, you know, 
some people just end up being like robots, like they go to work, you know, like they do the work, they come home, like they cook, they look after the kids or whatever, you know, having like that free time would give people like so much more time to like explore things like my account, you know, that I've created. Mm. People would have more time to, you know, like sit down and listen to podcasts and things like that, like go out, visit a museum, visit a gallery and things like that. So, yeah. Mm. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the museum because we haven't really touched on that. Because um, I do, I'm quite impressed with what they've done with the the museum. Because uh, I remember it when it was the, I remember it when it was the Civic Theatre. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, they've done it out, and I really love that massive map that they've put on yeah. the floor. I love that. Um, Same. So, yeah, I, I mean, uh, what was the experience of sort of working there was it a similar sort of thing of just like you're just surrounded by all the things that you're interested in and fascinated by well this this was slightly different because I, well one I was a volunteer so I worked like I say was working on the 200th birthday project mm. um, so I only actually met the project curators once in person this was in February 2020 mm. and then we went into lockdown in March um so we worked on this exhibition for well over a year remotely um so we selected the objects and everything remotely mm. we were just given access to the collections catalog yeah we did all the research and everything remotely and then eventually I think it was in the summer of 2020 one because the, the opening of the exhibition got delayed by a year just to account for the time that we'd lost mm. we eventually went into the museum you know we had like days in there um, and down at the discovery center as well at lead stock just looking at the objects and selecting which ones we wanted but i can just remember walking around the discovery center and walking around the museum just in complete awe you know of all the objects and then wanting to know you know about each one it's just <laughs> absolutely fascinating <laughs> yeah 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 um you know obviously history is a lot about story there's a lot of different yeah, angles yeah. and a lot of ways you can interpret things and you know mm. a lot of it's it, it's kind of it's about pieces but also missing pieces so before I throw the whole thing over to you I'm just trying to like eke out a few more minutes of content <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I like I just want to get your, yeah, just get you to speak about sort of historiography and and kind of that that side of of things. Your kind of thoughts on, I suppose, your own history, like your own historical creation. Because I suppose even with the the Instagram, to mm. a degree, you're creating a narrative with it. So I yeah. just want to get you to kind of reflect on that or share some thoughts on it. Um, it's not a really well formulated question i'm sorry <laughs> um, i was just thinking more in terms of like the hidden histories that i managed to bring out you know through the instagram account like it's really nice that i've actually in some ways been able to step away from historiography mm. because i'm not you know focusing on academics like i'm trying to make history accessible to the masses I, I want everyone to be able to access you know the posts that I write because this isn't also like another reason why I want to become a public historian I think that you know history and my research shouldn't just be kept within academic circles mm -hmm. it should be disseminated among you know non-academics like people of all ages or backgrounds should be able to you know, have access to this research because, you know, when you read journal articles and things like that, they're just, well, who reads journal articles apart from, you know, students and academics, you know, it's nice when you have like an accessible post on Instagram, that you know, that is probably less than a hundred words in some cases, mm. you know, it's got all things in there like journal, um, sorry, like newspaper articles and things like that, um, you know, pictures and places you know that no longer exist you know it's just like a little lens it's a window into the past mm. you know an accessible window into the past mm. and it's nice as well like I was saying about hidden history so you know like in some places like I've managed to highlight say the history you know of like the Jewish community so mm. for example I looked at this location just like two steps away from the Merion Centre which used to be a factory 
So I looked at like the, um, the street directories and I could see, you know, when I looked into who was living there, that there were quite a lot of Jewish people living there. Yeah. And like that kind of shakes up the narrative of the fact that, oh, you know, um, the Leeds Jewish community, everyone lived in the Leylands and um, the Leylands area of Leeds, which is like North Street and near Belgrade Music Hall um, mm -hmm. around there. Mm -hmm. So people think, oh, you know, they live around there. Well, actually, you know, if we dig a little deeper, you know, we can see that they did live, like they did live in other places around the city as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's nice that I, in some ways I am challenging historiography, but doing it like in a non-academic way, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of like the way that I present that and mm -hmm. in through, you know, the descriptions and content the posts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like you sort of mentioning public history there and, because obviously to an extent you yeah. Yeah, produce history um, and, you know, I suppose a lot of traditional historians and academics mm -hmm. would generally be working on their own apart from the odd interviews and things like that, but a large part yeah. of it would be working on your own. Like, uh, do you get to collaborate and kind of co-produce a lot more? Is that more your experience or is it still kind of, you know, on your own writing papers and, and so on and scouring through books and, and objects and I mean so I like I say I was really lucky that at Leeds Beckett um and as well at Leeds University when I was doing my masters that uh, I did work on a few public history projects mm. and I got to work with you know different organizations and members of the public but so from my, I'm currently applying for a PhD at the moment with um, the School of History at the University of Leeds. And like one of my methodologies is working with family archives and working with the Bradford Jewish community. Mm. So it would be nice, you know, to get those, um, to get members of the community involved, mm. um, you know, using their archives, um, chatting to people in the community about their own history, like their family history, using their records. Mm. to you know tell a different story than the ones you know that we already know about and um, highlighting you know some of the hidden histories mm. within that community mm. yeah that sounds awesome i did have another question there, that one. oh yeah so final final question on this and then i'll do that i'll throw it over to you so i want you to kind of um i'm assuming that you're going to have some history heroes so who are the okay. kind of who are the kind of history heroes for you? Who are the historians that you kind of like and who are influences for you? So the major one for me is Sharman Kaddish. So she is um, a Jewish historian. And basically when I started my um, writing my undergraduate dissertation, I was really struggling for a third chapter. Um, so this overarching theme was about identity and assimilation among the Leeds Jewish community. I went to my tutor, Shane Ewan, and I was like, I'm not sure, like, I don't know what I could do for, like, a third chapter. And he's like, think about cemeteries, you know, communities, like, are not just communities in life, they're also communities mm -hmm. in death. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking for literature online about cemeteries, and it's, like, a really underdeveloped area of, like, Jewish historiography. Mm -hmm. So, but I found this one person, Sharman Kadesh, who'd done, like, some research into Jewish cemeteries in Britain. So I was like, okay, great. And she'd written some really interesting stuff, you know, that gave me leads, you know, onto other things and like just basically led me down a little rabbit hole, which was mm. great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she's like a pioneer of like um, Jewish history, you know, like Jewish cemetery. So she's like my, um, hist she's like my history hero. Like I'd, I'd love to follow in her footsteps and you'd follow up on some of her leads. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, like more and more from doing this. I, I mean, my ideas obviously change over time as well, but um, yeah. like I'm just getting the sense more and more that, you know, people talk a lot about work, you know, work or just human activity in general yeah. being kind of problem solving and this, that and the other. But a lot of it is, you know, and we've touched on play in the podcast before and things like that. And, you know, you can have arguments about what's the distinction between play and work and how do you define yeah. these various things. But I think a lot of it as well is discovery. And, yeah. And I think that applies kind of for, for most things. You know, you 
either you're discovering work that someone has already done and you're kind of like adapting it for your own uses or you're discovering how to do something that you're not aware of how anyone's done it before. Um, and I suppose as well, like definitely with history and especially with your approach yeah. of like looking into new places and cracking things open and, and yeah. tumbling down new rabbit holes. That's very much a discovery process. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was, do you want to add anything? No, I'm just trying to think of something to add, something intelligent. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? When the, when the mic's on, of like to be spontaneous and like, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, go on. No, I'm just trying to think of something. <laughs> No, well, sorry, I can't think of anything. No, yeah, that's no, cool. I'm right, I'll do that. I'll, I'm going to pass it over to you anyway. So, um, okay. yeah, if there's anything that we've not touched on yet that you want to kind of talk about, now's the time to do it. And also, if you want to give us any relevant socials that you want to promote. So, yeah, I'll hand over to you. Okay. And there's nothing else that I really want to talk about. Start, but... start with your socials if you can't think of it. Yeah, no, I will do. <laughs> so, um the Instagram, the Instagram account that I was talking about earlier. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Instagram at Leeds Hidden Heritage. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need the underscores; it'd be fine. <laughs> you'll you'll find me. Just look for the pic, the black and white picture of the corn exchange. <laughs> not me. Um, I also tweet at Sophia underscore Lamb underscore Ten on Twitter as well. I'm involved in a lot of um, Twitter historian circles, so you'll probably see me linked in with loads of threads to do with, um, <laughs> yeah, the whole Twitter historian um, conversation thing that's going on. Yeah, I think that's just about everything. <laughs> does, does that get quite heated? Is there some, you know, ferocious history battles ongoing? Oh. Oh, yeah, there are. Sometimes I just have to leave. I was like, right, I'm going to go on to something else on Twitter. I'll just leave you to battle it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to feel like I've shortchanged you in terms of giving you the amount of time because we kind of run through this. But also, it's kind of good because I booked to go see uh, this. It's called Ode to Partition. Okay. Um, about Partition of India. Uh, so that. that's down at seven arts tonight uh, yeah so yeah if we finish early then i might actually make it on time <laughs> yeah that's fine so that, that'll be quite cool are there any particular kind of do you have a do you still have a favorite phase like a favorite time period in history like because you mentioned that the, yeah. you know you sort of got into it through the 60s and victorians have you have you still yeah. have a got have you still got a favorite age Oh, that's really hard. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I'd probably still say the Victorians, mainly because so I specialize in so I specialize in Anglo Jewish history, but mainly cemeteries. So mm -hmm. I really like, you know, like um, this whole idea of the celebration of death and like Victorian funerary culture. Mm -hmm. So it has to be the Victorian period. Mm -hmm. Do you find good stories? in Leeds from that period because you kind of you think about money and Dickens and you know smoky dark satanic mills and yeah sort of like um is it all really sort of grim up north kind of tales for for Leeds and surrounding areas or is there you know is it not that bad really it's just I don't know well like some things just really surprise me I mean so like, I've looked a lot at like mortality rates and things like that and mm. just especially like within the Jewish community and like comparing them to Gentiles, so non-Jewish people. Mm. I find it really interesting just how, you know, like even though we know that they were living in poor conditions, a lot of Jewish people, like especially in the Leeds, a lot of them had like this mortality advantage where like they lived a lot longer than gentiles like non-jewish people i was like that really interests me you know mm. like so they must have had i don't know like a better diet or a better quality of life but then like how you know how does this happen you were living in you know the same 
conditions and everything as mm. you know non-Jewish people you were just as poor as them but why are you living you know for a longer period of time like it's that fascinates me so have you have you come to any sort of like uh, anything leading towards conclusion and my guess would be something like it's to do with you know hygiene and the lifestyle code and sort of yeah. having a different you know I would imagine having kosher food would yeah would have an impact yeah I mean that is like the the argument that's been advanced by some historians but so like it was part it's of my too um, obvious as well though isn't it it's a bit yeah you know, kind of yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I will be researching a lot more into this. So part of my PhD project does look at infant mortality rates and adult and child mortality rates. I basically map infant mortality, you know, looking at like the disease environment, like mm. the environment that these people lived in, what diseases were most prevalent and things mm. like that. Looking at diets and like healthcare provisions and things like that, because there's like a whole link between assimilation and death rates and things like that so the idea that you know if you're more assimilated you can obviously speak the language mm. you know you're able to access better health care um you know you can can converse with doctors and medical professionals yeah. and things like that whereas you know if you're less assimilated you know you'll struggle to access things and not be able to read the literature and things like that that's being handed out so that is like one of the reasons as well but yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, as I get into my research more, you know, were there other reasons or, you know, I'm not sure, basically, I'm not sure what the answer is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing when you, you sort of, because you can go for that easy answer, but then it's kind of like, well, you yeah. scratch the surface a bit more. And, and like you say, with, with births, then, I mean, there might have been different birthing routines. There could have been yeah. like, you know, or it, it could be, they use a different hospital mm. or like it's so many so many variables but yeah it's yeah. interesting to find out and interesting to see what you can can kind of find i'm not going to torture you with dragging it out anymore in the hope of finding something else to say um i mean i should probably ask you like um i how do you have jewish heritage yourself why why the interest in sort of anglo jewish yeah I always get this question that every person that asks me, you know, what do you, what do you specialize in? No, so I'm not Jewish myself. It basically started with, um, so my grandma told me about my great granddad who actually used to work at the Burton's factory behind Leeds Beckett Cemetery, mm. um, Beckett's, Be sorry, Beckett Street Cemetery, mm. um, up in Hare Hills. Mm. Um, so like, he, like she told me that, you know, he used to work with, Jewish people you know it was a Jewish firm I was like yeah. okay this is interesting so I started doing a bit of research I was like this is actually a really interesting community mm. and then I got to study migration history at Leeds Beckett during my undergraduate degree I was like I'm really interested in the Jewish community we looked mm. at them you know during that module is there any scope for me to do um a dissertation about this topic and they said yes so it just basically stemmed from that yeah, it's just one of those things of like you found a fascinating thread and yeah. pulling it. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I didn't want to assume either, and I didn't want listeners to assume either. One yeah, of the things that I've been learning is don't assume, ask. You know. I will thank you on the recording. So thank you very much for doing this mm -hmm. and taking time out this evening. And um, yeah, I wish you the best of luck in the role and with the PhD, and that you get on the PhD and. Yeah, yeah, best of luck with that. And it'll be fascinating to see what you what you turn up with and contribute to the, the knowledge. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me come on the show. It's great. Thank you again to Sophia for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests and thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. And of course, most of all, thank you to you, my dear listener. You can follow the show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Leeds. Use the hashtag Working Hours Pod Leads to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released. DM me with your questions or most importantly to get in touch if you'd like to be my guest on this show. Not destroying your brain with social media? Then send me an email to workinghourspod at western-studios.com or if you'd like to be anonymous, email me at westernstudios at protonmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to share it with your networks.
Please, please do chuck in anything you can to help working hours grow. Go to Kofi, that's ko ficom forward slash working hours and join me there for £3 a month and or you can make any one-off donation of whatever amount through that site. Or you can go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support working hours from as little as a pound a month. There's also an Outlander tier for non loiners at £5 a month and a £12 a month big time tier for anyone who feels flash. I'm not really offering anything much on the Patreon yet, as I'm already doing more than enough unpaid labour on this project. If and when things pick up, then we'll see. The goal is to make the podcast and my commitment to it both possible and sustainable. If you are happy to make a regular contribution, but you're priced out by a pound a month, you can go to librapay.com, that's L-I-B-E-R-A-P-A-Y, dot com, forward slash Western Studios, forward slash donate, and donate from as low as a penny a week, all the way up to £89 a week. And people say I'm pessimistic. Again, you can also make one-off donations through LibrePay, which you can do either publicly or anonymously. Remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours. Work for peace and plan with kindness. Okay, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leeds. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Follow Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore leads. And on LinkedIn linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios or go to western hyphen studios dot com